When I was coming to church one Sunday a few, actually a couple years ago, I was driving to church one morning and I often drive by a van parked on the side of the road that a, a gentleman lives in that van. And this particular Sunday morning as I was driving to church, I noticed that someone had taken a big cinder block and thrown it into the rear window of the van and shattered the rear window and the cinder block was laying in the middle of the road, glass shattered around it on the road and the pavement. And I had to drive around it and drive uh, to not hit the cinder block. But I initially thought of the person living in the van and how someone had obviously tried to harass them the evening before. It looked like it had happened probably the night before. And so I kept on my way to church, came to church services uh, as normal, and then drove home, grabbed lunch uh, with my wife. And then after lunch, I said to my wife, I'm going to go check on this gentleman that lives in the van. I want to go check on him, make sure he's okay. And, uh, you know, I can remember the feeling of being uncomfortable with that, right? Like, uh, because I didn't know how he was going to respond. I didn't know if he was frightened, if he was angry. I didn't know if he was struggling with a mental illness or an addiction. Uh, I didn't know what kind of response I would get as I went there. Now, I'm not recommending everybody do this. I've In the past, a former, before ministry, I was a mental health counselor and dealing with people in crisis. So I've been in crisis situations with people before. And so I have a little bit of experience about how to handle those situations. So I'm not saying everybody needs to go do this. What we are saying, though, is that there are times when God wants us to go love and care for somebody, and it can make us uncomfortable, right? We can be uncomfortable with what uh, what God is asking us to do. And sometimes loving people, caring for people is uncomfortable, especially when we don't know them, when they're different than we are, when we can't always understand what's going on in their lives. And sometimes loving people can also be a little messy, right? And so I went that afternoon to check on him and I talked to him and he opened up the door. Now, I'll never forget the smell that came out of the, the, the vehicle when he opened the door and as I engage him in conversation and just see, just asking, you know, did he have food? Did he have water? Uh, did, were there, did he need any help cleaning things up? All those things. I just checked on his basic needs and then asked him if he was okay. Like I saw what had happened and I just apologized. I said, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You know, uh, that, that's, that's not, that wasn't a very nice thing for somebody to do. And he was a little rattled by it and upset by it. And And uh, the good news was he had food, he had water, he had warm uh, things for nights and all that stuff. And so all the basic needs were being met, but I also wanted him just to know he was okay, that somebody cared about him, that somebody noticed uh, and wanted to know that he was okay. And he really thanked me for stopping and having a conversation with me. It turned out someone else had brought him some food, so I wasn't the only one who was caring for him and loving him and expressing love to him. Now, there was a point in that process, as I just said, that I felt uncomfortable, right? And here's the thing. Sometimes the things that God wants us to do and the, the people that God calls us to love is going to make us uncomfortable. They're going to be different than us, right? Not everybody is the same. But we're called to love everybody. Jesus said, actually, in Luke chapter 6, if we love those who love us, what credit is that to us? That's easy, right? Right? He says, we're called to love those who aren't lovable in our minds, right? Everybody's lovable, actually, but sometimes in our minds, it's uncomfortable to love, and we may see others as unlovable. One of the things that we're talking about in these uncomfortable conversations are these places where we feel uncomfortable. And one of the things that I, I noticed in some of the feedback from our, about our discipleship plan that we put out to the congregation recently is that some of the wording at the beginning about loving people, about loving all people, made some people uncomfortable. They read it as a political statement rather than a biblical statement. So we want to talk about that today. Let's talk about this uncomfortable statement about loving all people. And really, this is a biblical statement, and really, this is a Methodist or a Wesleyan statement, because the Wesleyan idea, and we're going to be teaching through this series around some Methodist uh, theology and Wesleyan theology and, and Methodism, and thinking about what is it about us as Methodists that calls us to love people, even people that don't look like us, act like us, uh, any of those things, right? What is that about? So one of the things we have to keep in mind, one, first of all, this is biblical. Uh, when you look at the Bible, Paul 
often makes a list of categories of different people groups when he's trying to express this nature of all people, right? And so he lists out Greek and slave and free and things. He does this in Colossians. He does this in Galatians. We see in the Bible this idea that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to salvation. We see that in 2 Peter, in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We see that God's desire is for all people to be saved. And so as Methodists, we actually believe that God's salvation and God's grace is available to all people, whether they look like us, act like us, or not. That we're actually not looking for people to look just like us, but God's grace goes out to what? And Jesus said to make disciples of all nations, all ethnicities, all cultures, all backgrounds, all identities, right? So all these different things that we think about uh, that are sometimes get politicized is really about a biblical call to express God's love and grace to all, right? This is very Wesleyan in nature to do that. So like, for example, if you ever come to church here and you take communion with us, when we do communion, we make it available to everyone. It, we all, all, we want to encourage everyone to receive God's grace. So this is part of the nature of our Methodist understanding of things. And it actually comes from John Wesley. John Wesley uh, actually, in a, in a way, got kicked out of the church, so to speak, like B.T. Roberts got kicked out of the Methodist church and became free, started the free Methodist denomination. So it's interesting how people, you know, these leaders got encouraged out of the church and outside the walls of the church, and so then they go start preaching to the masses. And John Wesley started preaching to uh, coal miners and people in poverty and people in fields, and he, was, he became a street preacher, a field preacher, a coal miner preacher, right? And so he left, had to go beyond the walls of the church, which is really what discipleship is about often is about us going beyond the walls of our church and reaching people who we wouldn't normally reach or spend time with. And so that's what Wesley did. Here's what Wesley said about that. He said, I consented to become more vile. I consented to become more vile. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that John Wesley wasn't going to be holy? No. What it meant was that he knew that when he was going to be in relationship and offer God's love and grace and salvation to people, other people groups, that it was going to be messy, right? It was going to be messy, and he was going to have to spend some time in places that he wouldn't normally have spent time as a clergyman in the, in the Church of England, right? And so he was willing to become more vile, like Jesus, who ate with sinners and tax collectors. Charles Wesley, who wrote some of his hymns, uh, the brother of John Wesley, actually wrote some of the hymns to popular uh, songs and lyrics, not lyrics, but popular um, music that was sung in the taverns of his day. So he was taking bar song, technically simplifying bar songs, and putting them to lyric theological teaching uh, at times. And so he did that at times in his effort to reach people to become more vile, so to speak. So we see some of that going on in uh, John Wesley's approach to the gospel. Now, here we're going to teach here a little bit, and this might be a good place to take some notes, and especially if you're new to the church or not a part of church world, uh, I'm going to use some big language, but I'm going to simplify it for us as well to get, kind of help us get our heads around And then I'm going to teach some things about this grace that we emphasize in Methodism. And John uh, Wesley emphasized uh, three types of grace in Methodism. There's three graces. Uh, they're called prevenient grace. These are big words for uh, prevenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. And so they really are three stages of the Christian life. And so prevenient grace is God's grace offered to us to prepare us and get us ready um, to receive salvation and grace from God. And then justifying grace is that time, that moment, or that season when we receive God's grace and we are justified or put right with God. We call this personal salvation uh, beginning a personal relationship with, with God uh, through Jesus Christ. And then the third part is sanctifying grace, where we be, are entering this process of becoming holy. And we're actually going to talk more about that in another message. So we're going to talk today about the first two graces a little bit more. So, but to simplify that, to make it easier for us to get our heads around this, think of it this way. Here's a, a way to think of it. There are three, these God's graces. God's grace prepares us for for salvation, and then we 
God's grace changes us, and then God's grace grows us, right? So prepares us, changes us, grows us. So how does it prepare us, and how are we to be a part of this preparation process as the people of God? Um, you know, I've seen that Christians, in our interactions with other people that are different than us, we can either be preparing people to receive God's grace or preventing people from receiving God's grace in how we relate to them. So if we come across as judgmental and judgy, kind of, kind of come across that way, we actually may be preventing them from experiencing God's grace and salvation for themselves. And so a lot of times we see this actually in street evangelism. We'll see street preachers, not like John Wesley, but today's street preachers where they're, they're arguing and they're yelling and they're screaming and they're judging, right? And very few people are convicted by that. Very few people are experiencing God's love for them. Now, there may be a place for that, and I'm not ruling out, we're not ruling out the power of the Holy Spirit to work in that. Uh, but I've seen street evangelists who try and debate and argue and all it does is create more debate and argument. And then I've seen other people who go and love people, care for people, and as a result, they share salvation, share the gift of faith with those people, and people are accepting Christ because they feel cared and loved for. So this love and grace that cares for them actually begins to prepare them for the openness for kind of cultivate, like cultivating the soil of their hearts to make them open to receive God's grace and love for themselves. So think about that. How we love and relate to people can either prepare them or prevent them from receiving God's love and grace for themselves. Think about that. So how we interact with others. Now, what we're going to one of the other questions that people often ask is said, well, does God just leave people away? Does God just love people and offer grace to people and just leave them that way? Do is there an expectation to change? Do we have to expect people to change? And really, it's not so much an expectation to change as it is inevitable. Change is inevitable. Because once we experience God's grace and love for ourselves, when we have that experience, it can't help but change us, right? There's a change that's just naturally going to occur within us, and it's not an expectation as much as it's an inevitability, right, for us to change. So here's some of the things. We're actually going to use Romans 8, some verses out of Romans 8. I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter later today, but we're going to pull some verses out, but it makes sense that you read the whole chapter. But we're going to take a look at the first chapter of Romans 8, and we're going to look at some verses that show us what changes in us when we receive God's grace, when we come to know salvation, when we begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ, that this is what changes in us. And Romans 8 is a great way, place to find out about that. This is also how Methodists or Wesleyans would, uh, would apply these verses. So what changes, here's the question, what changes when a person becomes a Christian? What changes when a person becomes a Christian? Now the first thing that changes is that we're freed from the guilt of sin. We're freed from the guilt of sin. We're freed from guilt. Who doesn't want to be, who wants to walk around guilty all the time, right? We, we, this is the good news that we're freed. Here's what it says in Romans, the very beginning, first verse of Romans 8. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So at the moment of salvation or justification, we're put right with God, we're no longer condemned in Christ. We enter into Christ and God sees Christ in us and we are not condemned anymore. We're freed from the guilt of our sin. That's good news for all of us, right? Because one of the things we understand from the Bible and from our background and our roots is that all sin and God's grace is offered to all. So all sin and all are offered, offered grace. So that's good news. The second thing that changes, number two, is that we now have a new desire to please God over our sinful desires. So we now all of a sudden have within us this desire that we didn't have before. Like this is, we call this repentance, you know, that one, if someone is running away from God, not wanting to have anything to do with God. They make a 180 degree turn back to God and they have this new desire to want to orient and center their lives and build their lives around God. 
Here's what Romans 8, 5 said. It says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. See that Paul is saying, you have a, when we become Christians, we have a new mindset. That changes. And our mindset is to please God, not just ourselves. And we see that in people uh, when they become Christians, when they accept Jesus Christ, when they come into Christ and put their faith in Jesus, what happens is they have this new desire to want to please God. And this sometimes is instantaneous, and sometimes this is over a lifetime, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I remember a gentleman who came to me, and um, he struggled with uh, uh, internet pornography, and he struggled with this um, of, of going to these online images. And one of the things that was happening was he was, this was messing with his relationship with his wife. He knew that it was in getting in the way of his relationship with God. And so he would seek counsel out from others. And I was one of the people that he would seek counsel from. And as we would talk, he was constantly wrestling with this desire. So he had this sin, what we would call a sinful desire, right? And yet he was fighting it. He was struggling against it. He was wanting to please God over this desire, right? So he knew this desire was getting in the way of him growing in relationship to God and growing in his relationship to his spouse. So he knew that he needed to conquer this. And so he struggled against this for many, many years. In fact, his whole life. He's since passed away. But I know he struggled with that his whole life. But here's what we would often talk about. I would say to him, I'm actually glad you're here. I'm glad you're talking about this because this shows that you want to please God over your sinful desire. And so the struggle, just being engaged in the struggle with the sinful desire is part of being a Christian because that's the new orientation he got when he became a Christian. Uh, and when he became, a, see, he was struggling with this before he became a Christian. Then he became a Christian. And now he began to see that this desire was not something that God wanted in his life and he wanted to fight against it. And so his desire to please God was now at work in him and not to please his desires. So that's, a, that's something else that changes. Number three, there's freedom from the power of sin. There's freedom from the power of sin. That's our third point. So our third idea is that freedom from the power of sin, and it says in Romans 8 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. So when a person becomes a Christian, the Spirit of God begins to live in them. The Spirit of God comes into our lives, and we now have someone who helps us overcome the power of sin in our lives. We've already con Jesus has already conquered the power of sin in terms of our relationship with God, and we need the Holy Spirit to come alongside of us and help us with the power of sin, our sin nature, through the rest of our lives, the moment of salvation. And so we have this counselor, this advocate, this person uh, of, the, the, of the Godhead who comes alongside of us and empowers us to uh, no longer have this sin be at work in us. And so this idea, though, is connected to this Wesleyan idea, this Methodist idea that we actually have to cooperate <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. We have to kind of help work with the Holy Spirit in our lives because if we don't, then we're just going to continue to live in sin. And this is why we see that even Christians continue to do things that are sinful. Even Christians aren't perfect. Christians don't get it all right. At the same time, we've seen, I've seen people come to salvation uh, and immediately their drug addiction is gone. Uh, or immediately some behavior is immediately changed within 24 hours of them becoming Christians. And it's like the power of the Holy Spirit comes in and eradicates that particular sin from their lives. But it doesn't mean there aren't other sinful desires at work in them that, they, that really takes that lifelong, like we just shared with that other person, that lifelong journey to struggle against and conquer and to please God instead of our sinful desire. But the good news is, is that God gives us the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation to help us in that process, which we call sanctifying grace. We talked about earlier. We'll talk more about that uh, here as well. So that's what we're talking about. So this freedom from the power of sin. And then the fourth thing that we would mention here is we get a new identity. Like you get a new passport. You get a new 
uh, uh, license. You get a new identity, right? And the identity here is in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. It says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We are God's children. That's our new identity. And for the Christian, this new identity actually becomes the identity that we're to live into into the future, in the rest of our lives. So the moment of salvation, we become a Christian, or the season of salvation, and from that point on, we live into this new identity as a child of God. That's good news as well, that we have this new uh, person to become, to grow into, that sanctifying grace that grows us, right, into this new identity. And this identity becomes the primary identity over every other identity we may hold to in our lives. This is really neat because here's the thing that happens when we take on this new identity. That no matter where I go, when I meet other Christians, no matter whether or not we, you know, if I travel around the world or travel into other cultures or other ethnic groups, if they're a Christian and I'm a Christian, we have the same identity. We are both children of God. And when this identity is at work in us as our primary identity, what we experience is community and unity because we have this shared identity that is primary for both of us over all the other identities we have, whether it's a national identity or ethnic identity or cultural identity. Those things shape us and are part of who we are. But this new identity actually helps create community and unity within us. I've seen this happen as I've traveled around the world and engaged people in different cultures that when they're a Christian, I'm a Christian, even though we can't speak the same language, we have this shared identity that binds us together and unifies us together in ways that are unspoken. Uh, and if you've ever experienced that, you'll know that as well as a Christian. Um, so that's something that happens. So the two things that really happen in us is this idea that we're freed and we're renewed, right? We have, new, we have a freedom and we have a, a renewal that happens in us as Christians. So we're freed from the guilt of sin and the power of sin, and we now have a new desire to please God and a new identity to live into as a child of God. And so we're freed and renewed. And this sets us up perfectly for this life of sanctification or this life of spiritual growth where we experience God's grace that helps us to become holy. And we live a life of holiness. And so this really is great that God would do this, right? That God would set us up this way for this life of change and renewal within our own spirits. Because we have this new desire to please God. We have a spirit that helps empower us, right, in this relationship with God and our, in, in our sin nature. And then we have this new identity in Christ that creates unity and community for us. Now, you take in all of Romans 8, if you read the whole chapter, there's one other verse that we have to key in on this morning. It's verses 12 and 13. It says this. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, body you will live. This still, you know, so we have the on the one end of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we have, there's no condemnation, right? Awesome. And now there's also an obligation, right? There's no condemnation, but there's also an obligation to live as a child of God and to live in to this freedom and this renewal that God has provided for us and to start that journey. And we start that journey the moment we accept Christ in our lives. So I thought we'd understand that, I hope we understand, see, that if we're really experiencing the love of God at the depth of our souls, it's not that change is expected, it's that change is just naturally going to happen to us. Because when someone loves you deeply and cares for you deeply and offers you grace and love and forgiveness, the natural response is to love them back, right? The natural response is it's not an expected response. It's just a natural response to that, right? To being loved. And that's what God does for us in Jesus Christ. So I want to get back to our feelings of being uncomfortable loving other people. 
And I want us to just take a moment, and those of us particularly, if you're, if you're not a Christian, I'm, we're glad you're here. Thanks for being here. And I hope this has helped you understand what salvation happens in salvation and that we pray that that would be a desire of yours. And if you want to know Christ, if you want to accept Christ for, your, for yourself, uh, we'd be glad to pray with you and help usher in and invite you into the life of Christ uh, yourself. I also want to talk to the Christians here today. Those of you who experienced what we just talked about, we want to say, I want you to just take a moment, and we're going to end this just by taking a moment to think back. Because when we've been a Christian a long time, it gets real easy to forget the initial feelings that God had for us. Those initial, that initial feeling that I'm loved by God, I'm, I've accepted God's grace, and we're no longer condemned. Remember that feeling when you became a Christian? Maybe it was a day, maybe it was a moment, maybe it was a season of your life. But I want us to think back as Christians to that moment, what it felt like to be loved by God, what it felt like to no longer be condemned, to no longer be judged, but be offered forgiveness from sin. You remember that moment? You remember that day? You remember that season? Just think about that, how deeply you are loved by God. And what changed in your life that moment, that season? What what changed about you? Did you get a new desire to follow God, to orient your life to God? Did you experience the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you? What happened inside of you? Remember that. Because we can forget over the years what it was like. And here's the last question. Do you want that for other people? Do you want other people to experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ? Do you want them to experience the freedom and the renewal and the newness of life that you experienced in your life? And if so, maybe you and I have to become like John Wesley, be willing to become more vile, (laughs) to be uncomfortable and to have some uncomfortable conversations and have some uncomfortable relationships with people that are different than us, not because we want to be uncomfortable, but because we love them and we know that God loves them, that they matter to God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you loved us first, that even Jesus was willing to become more vile for us. He was willing to become flesh itself that Paul just talked about. He was willing to go to a cross and die on a cross and to become a criminal on a cross He was willing to become the most vilest of all in human terms, but not in your terms, God. He was willing to take on our sin so that we could know that we are no longer condemned because of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And so, Lord, thank you for your love poured out for us in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would help us to love others that are different than us to love all, and to share God, your love, God, and your grace with all that we meet. That we not just exclude ourselves from other certain relationships because they make us uncomfortable. Help us to love people no matter what, because God, you love people no matter what. Thanks be to God. Amen.